I would invite you to turn in our Father's Word to Luke chapter 16, beginning in verse 19. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abram's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. In hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abram far away with Lazarus in his bosom. So he called to him, Father Abram, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I am in agony in this fire. But Abram replied, Son, Remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone come over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house. For I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abram replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abram, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to him, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. This is the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father in heaven, speak to our hearts now because we, your servants, are listening. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. It is so easy for people to get caught up in the world's mentality of success. Wealth and position and power are obviously the outward signs of a successful life, uh, according to the world. (laughs) But the Bible reminds us again and again that what the world might consider to be success could be failure with God. And what the world considers to be failure might be success with God. But because of the deceitfulness of riches, this has not always convinced people to live according to God's Word. In fact, many people have embraced the idea of the world's view of success, only bathed it in their religious garb. In other words, if you have wealth and if you have position and power, obviously God is blessing you, therefore you are righteous. And if you don't have money and if you are ill or suffering in some way, there's only one explanation. You must be a sinner. You're not part of the righteous. That's nothing new. That's as old as Job's friends. But the Pharisees made a dogma out of it. It's so easy for people to use religion to cloak their greed, their self-righteousness, their ambition, and their indifference to people who have needs. This, I think, is really what we're reading here in this story with the rich man as opposed to the beggar. So here we have another story, another passage in the gospel about the rich and the poor. Usually when Christians study this passage, they like to identify with Lazarus. I mean, obviously, because he goes to heaven. (laughs) 
But I wonder if that's really what the point is for this story. Uh, if you read the entire chapter, Jesus has already given one parable about the unjust steward who, while he has control over the money, can use it in some way to guarantee a future for himself when he is fired. And then there's this account of the rich man and Lazarus. But in between, uh, we are told in verse 14 and 15 that these teachings really bothered the Pharisees because they loved money. And not only that, they turned up their noses at the teachings of Jesus whenever it came into this area. Jesus is very much convinced then that these messages in this chapter will be addressed to the Pharisees, but they will also be addressed to His disciples because again and again He is warning His disciples and us to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Now, if we identify in the story with Lazarus because he goes to heaven, that's about all we have to compare with because we in the Western church are not like Lazarus. We are very affluent by the world's standards. We have more than we need and certainly more of the share of the world's goods. And all you have to do is look around at church complexes and programs and the money that is available. And we look at this as tremendous evidence of success. But I wonder if Jesus Christ came to evaluate our works today, would He find in the midst of all of this works of righteousness, acts of mercy, promotion of justice, or would he find self-righteous smugness that he found with the Pharisees? I think we need to read this passage again with a view to taking a good hard look at ourselves and our churches. There is an account, a very famous account, of a meeting between Thomas Aquinas and the Pope. Thomas went in one day to visit the Pope, and the Pope happened to be counting money. <laughs> and the Pope said to Thomas, Look, Thomas, no longer can the church say, Silver and gold have I none. And Thomas responded, That is true, but no longer can it say, In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, take up your bed and walk. We have to ask what the affluent world does to our spiritual lives and to our service to God. And this story gives us a chance to think it through. There are only two parts to the story. The first part is very short, and it tells us who the participants are, the rich man and Lazarus. And so we have the contrast between these two people, but it's in it's in the here and now. It's in this world. We're introduced first to the rich man, and the text doesn't give us a great deal of detail except to describe in very economical terms. He is extremely wealthy. He has the finest clothes and foods and, and living style that was possible in the land. He's wearing robes that normally would be fit for nobles and priests, and he is feasting and celebrating in his wealth every day. There's no high season for him. Every day is a party. Every day is his celebration. He is clearly self-indulgent, and he is clearly living for his own enjoyment of life. And in doing so, he is ignoring the fact that there is a beggar lying right at his door. He would have to cross that threshold every day and see him. He didn't seem to mind the beggar being there. He just wasn't going to do anything for him. Uh, not because he was just cold and indifferent, but because it went against his beliefs. Uh, he had reasons. Now, the text does not tell us that he was a Pharisee. However, given the fact that Jesus is addressing the Pharisees when he's telling this story, and the fact that the comments in the text tell us that they loved wealth, 
it is very likely that he either is a Pharisee or he is heart and soul with the Pharisees in their beliefs. And in addition to what I've just uh, said, they would view that wealth and position and power are clear evidences that God was blessing them or that they were the righteous. In fact, in the Jewish literature, there is a parallel parable. It doesn't come out the same way, though, because in their telling of this little parable, when the two people die, the rich man goes to Abram's bosom because he's righteous, <laughs> and the poor man goes to hell because he's a sinner. Just complete reverse of what the passage is here in the text of Scripture. But there's also a theological idea involved here. We know this man claims to be a member of the covenant. He's going to address Abram as his father. And yet there is an empty ring to this that is so characteristic of the Pharisees. You see, in early Judaism, the Jewish people believed that Abram was so righteous, so obedient to God, that the merit that Abram earned spilled over to his descendants. And as a result, then, they had a share in the world to come if they were of their father Abram. And that's what they claim. We are of our father Abram, <laughs> to which Jesus says, no, you're of your father the devil. Uh, why? Why are they the seed of the serpent? Because they're trying to kill the seed of the woman. It's a very simple equation, but they didn't see it. But this man shows he is not really a true son of Abram. I mean, Abram was willing to give away the whole promised land just to keep peace within the family. This man isn't going to give a crumb to a beggar at the gate. He also didn't know his history. He could have read back into the Scriptures, as we did today in Amos, but here you have these people feasting, reclining on beds that are inlaid with ivory, drinking wine by the bowlful, celebrations and feasts and drinking were the evidence not of their spirituality, but it was the evidence of their self-promotion and indulgence, and the prophet said they would be the first to go into exile. This man should have known these things if he was truly a son of Abraham, but it's going to come out clear in the passage, he didn't care about the Scripture. That really isn't his interest. Uh, like most Pharisees, he wants a sign. He wants something that will be spectacular, but he has no intention of obeying. We can clearly discern from this story that what we're being told is that the feasting and celebrating and enjoying the good life and forgetting the poor is an abomination to God. And it's the evidence that the man has no faith and no righteousness. There's little, there's no little value in showing off to the world with all of your affluence if you know that God finds it sinful because it's going to be short-lived. Then we're introduced to the poor man. We're not told a lot about him, but here, interestingly enough, he has a name. Um, that's unusual for parables. It is possible that someone was in mind in the story that Jesus is telling. Uh, this led the church fathers to give a name to the rich man <laughs> because he's not mentioned here. There's no name given for him because uh, he's not worth remembering. And the Bible made it very clear in the Old Testament there's no remembrance of the wicked in Sheol. But they gave him a name, Dives, which is just the Latin for the rich man. But Lazarus means God helps. I mean, who else is going to? Here's this man. He's a poor beggar. He has nothing to hope in except what God might provide. He makes no claims. He doesn't rail or accuse. He simply waits for some crumbs to fall from the table of this rich man. He's so ill and weak that his friends have to carry him to bring him to the entranceway to this rich man's house so that hopefully he will be able to find something that would give him some hope, give him some nourishment. And the irony in here, of course, is that 
it would have taken such a little effort for this rich man to drop a few crumbs his way. But how could he do that? Because the man's a sinner, and you don't encourage the sinners. You know, they, they, they are that way because they have sinned against God. He had all the answers, and it seemed to justify his indifference. We have the answers, too. <laughs> I don't know if you've fallen into this trap. You'll see somebody who might be begging, uh, asking for help. Thought comes to your mind, oh, he's only going to use it on drugs, so don't give it to him. Or you see someone and you say, better not give it to him. It'll just encourage them. <laughs> Maybe they need some encouragement. <laughs> I don't know. We've got all the reasons why we can pass by and do nothing. And this man had thought it through, and uh, he was well convinced of his theology that that man's begging because he's a sinner, and I am wealthy because I'm righteous. And uh, he was happy with that. The second half of the story will now be a description of the rich man and the poor man in the next life. <laughs> Here we're told, first now, Lazarus, that he died. And um, we don't have evidence in the text for this, but knowing the culture and knowing what the Pharisees did, there would have been for, say, the rich man, a rather elaborate funeral. Uh, they had their own tombs carved out of the rocks. We know that. They had people mourn for them, and if there weren't any mourners, they would pay somebody to come and mourn for them. There would be processions, no doubt some eulogies. This would have been quite a ceremony. But what does the text tell us? That he died and was buried. <laughs> Forget about whatever else was done. And we know that if a poor man like the beggar Lazarus died, he would have had a rather ignominious burial. Uh, the body thrown into an open grave or buried or wrapped in some kind of a sheet and put in, not in a family tomb, not with much pomp. But that's not the way the story tells us the account. Lazarus died. No elaborate funeral here. But the angels of God carried him to paradise in a ceremony that would have been far more glorious than anything than that rich man could have bought. He's born to the other side by the angels, carried, we're told, to Abram's bosom. It's a very, very bold picture for, for, um, for paradise because it really means that, that he is drawn to the heart of Abram in glory. He's not just going to go and sit down beside Abram or, or shake his hand or whatever else. No, Abram is going to embrace him and welcome him into paradise because he's a true son of Abram, and God is making it right for him. Abram was a rich man. He was very rich. He was very powerful. <laughs> he was very famous. But Abram didn't disdain to wrap his arms around this poor beggar and welcome him into paradise. That's the glory. That's the true faith. That's true righteousness. He's a son of Abram, and now he will be at rest. On this earth, he was never welcomed into the house of the rich man. He wasn't even allowed in the temple because of his illnesses and sores, but he's welcomed in glory and born there by the angels. There's a parallel passage in the Old Testament in Psalm 73 where the righteous man Asaph is seeing the wealth of the world around him, and he becomes frustrated and troubled by it until he goes into the sanctuary and considers their latter end, that the wicked will be destroyed suddenly. 
but he, the righteous, will be received in glory. And it's that perspective that enables him to understand how God is working in the world and not to jump to conclusions too quickly. The rich man dies, and we're not told anything about him except he goes to hell. And all of a sudden, the reverse is taking place. The man who had so much misery here on this world is now at peace in glory uh, with Father Abram. And the one who had everything going his way in this life in great comfort and ease now is in torment and in misery. And so what he does is he cries out to Abram. Now, you don't try to decide on a parable like this how close heaven is to hell and whether they can talk across the gap or whatever else. This is a parable, and yet what he's basically saying is here's this man who is going to cry out to Abram because he in some way has been able to discern and to see that Lazarus is in paradise and he is in these tormenting flames. And so his prayer is very amazing. It sounds like such a little thing. If you could just send Lazarus to, to dip his finger in water and let him cool my tongue here in the torment, what a little thing to ask. What a little thing to throw a few crumbs to Lazarus. Why is he asking for Lazarus to do this? Maybe he feels that might salvage his conscience, or maybe he might feel that, that uh, he's being forgiven in some way, or maybe, maybe he feels that Lazarus is now with the power. We don't know, but he wants Lazarus to do this. And Abram says, no. It doesn't matter if Lazarus wants to, he can't cross the chasm. And it doesn't matter if uh, you want to come, you can't cross. And there isn't any prayer that's going to be answered that is issued from hell. So the answer is no. Here the first request of the man is again thinking of himself, his own comfort, his own in, in enjoyment, and, and a little bit of relief, but it isn't going to happen. So he asks another question. He says, I've got five brothers. Send Lazarus to my father's house that he can warn these brothers of mine not to come to this horrible place. And again, the answer will be no. And the answer is very clear. They have Moses and the prophets. They have the Scripture. Let them listen to those. And he protests. He says, no, no, the... But if, if, if Lazarus comes back from the dead, this will be a sign. He's always looking for a sign, not Scripture, but the sign. Well, the Pharisees didn't care much for Jesus' signs. When he did signs, they accused him of doing them by Satan. So they had their mind closed to that because they had their minds made up over what they were and what he was. I think what we're being told here in the passage is that the five brothers are just like this rich man. They are living a very self-indulgent and affluent life. And the word of the Lord never phased the rich man in his life to change what he was doing. It's not going to phase these people to change and show mercy to others and to live out a life of righteousness because they're enjoying the good life. And what he is saying is that if, if they don't obey the Scriptures, if they're not interested in living in according to the Scriptures, a sign isn't going to convince them to change, because they can easily explain that away as a trick or satanic or whatever. And so they have Moses and the prophets. Let them obey them. That's really uh, the implication of this passage. They won't believe even if a sign comes. They won't believe even if Lazarus showed up on their doorstep and said he's come back. Why? Because they've already predisposed themselves to think that they are right with God and they are enjoying God's benefits and they're not going to change. And they have the Scripture and they won't listen to it. But they ignored the Scripture that told them that they must show mercy that they must 
help the people who are poor, that they must grant favors and privileges to people who are in need, because those were the evidences of righteousness. Without any proof of their faith, there is no faith. Without any evidence, there's no righteousness. And Jesus came looking for righteousness in the people of his day, and he didn't find it. And it's interesting when he discusses in the judgment scenes that he judges them on the basis of the evidence of their righteousness. You remember the passage very well. He says something to the effect that uh, I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty, you didn't give me anything to drink. Uh, I was in need of clothing and you didn't give me any clothing to wear. And of course, the, the response he gets is, well, when did we see that? You know, that doesn't, we don't even remember that. And Jesus' answer is, in that you did not do it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did not do it to me. We are so easily wrapped up in our own lives, in our own creaturely comforts, in our own self-promotion and our gaining of reputations, and we fail to see that we're not that different than the Pharisees. They, they loved money. They loved to be in the best seats in the synagogues. They loved to be recognized in the marketplace. They loved titles, and yet they were not living righteous lives. So easy for us to get caught up in the way of the world. It's not wrong, of course, to be wealthy. It's wrong to use it in violation of the Scriptures or in calloused indifference to people who are in need. God expects to find in people who claim to be righteous evidence of genuine faith. And over and over and over again in Scripture, He focuses on one aspect of that evidence what you do to help people who are in need. That becomes a very important principle in the Bible. True religion is taking care of the widow and the orphan and the poor and the needy and the alien in your midst. What we have to do, I think we who claim the name of Christ is we have to begin looking for objects of mercy because when you start looking, you'll find they're at your door. I know the explanations. There's so many poor and there's so much trouble in the world. What can I do? These are not the questions to be answering or asking. It's not so much how much you give. It's that you give that is important. A number of years back, I was in Africa at a convention, and there was a man there, a British fellow, who was delightful, strange, but delightful. Um, he was really poor. He taught in a Bible college in Kenya, and the conference was in Zimbabwe. Uh, you have to look it up on the map. But uh, he hitchhiked from Kenya to Zimbabwe to come to the conference because he had no money. He hung out with us because we bought him coffee, and uh, he had nowhere else to go. At the end of our time there, we were getting ready to come home, and my colleague and I from a different seminary decided we had some money left over. We would give it to Richard. Don't think too highly of us. It was the seminary's money. It wasn't ours. <laughs> it was given to us for spending, and we thought, well, why should we take it? Here's a man that has great needs. And so it was a couple hundred dollars, and we thought, and he was planning to get married the next month, but he had not a cent to his name. And so we said, Richard, we, you know, we want you to have this money because we think it'll help. I mean, tears came to his eyes, and he just looked at us, and he said, praise God. He says, I know who needs this, and I'll make sure he gets it. 
that's what I think the Scripture is talking about. There are always people who need more than you and I. And God expects us to be aware and to be involved and to be active. For us, Eliot says, is only the trying. The rest is not our business.